with the essentials of cryptography covered, we have reached chapter 3, where we will get to know the theoretical foundations of X509 PKIs, which we will then use in the following chapter to construct from scratch a two-tier X509 PKI, whose certificates we will ultimately use to secure email communication. As an introductory repetition of the very general idea, X509 PKIs or authorities issuing X509 certificates to end entities like an Alice and a Bob. With these certificates, the PKI assigns cryptographic public keys to the end entities, and it's then these public keys that can be used for various cryptographic purposes, such as providing confidentiality to data exchanged by means of encryption, or to provide authenticity to data by means of message authentication codes or cryptographic digital signatures. The key challenge for an X509 PKI is how to construct trust in this system such that Alice and Bob can really rely on the public keys provided by the certificates to be authentic in order for the public key ultimately used to secure the data to really be the public key belonging to the intended peer that they communicate with. Technically speaking, an X509 PKI is simply an architectural model defined in RFC 5280, which is an architectural model for a system creating, distributing and revoking X509 certificates. With these X509 certificates, the PKI essentially assigns cryptographic public keys to end entities, and if the X509 PKI is sufficiently well implemented, the cryptographic public-private key pairs involved can be used to achieve all four of the classic cryptography security goals, confidentiality, integrity, authenticity, and non-repudiation. As a system, an X509 PKI is made up of a couple of core pillars. An X509 PKI, as we will get to clearly see in the next few lessons, is a large-scale application of asymmetric public key cryptography. And as such, it's clear that the first core pillar of an X509 PKI is cryptography, together with various other bits of technology, such as hardware and software required to manage the issuance, distribution and revocation of digital X509 certificates. Having dealt with the technological part of an X509 PKI and the first pillar, the remaining three core pillars then serve the purpose of constructing trust, in the X509 PKI. In order to create trust, an X509 PKI has to establish clear policies on the structure, governance, processes and legal elements of the functionalities it provides. With these policies captured and publicly provided in a certificate policy document, usually abbreviated as CP, with this CP document then having a structure and format as defined in RFC 3647. The certificate policy document, which is a document describing the policies of the X509 PKI, is complemented with a certification practice statement document, CPS, which is again a document with a structure and format defined in RFC 3647. And with this certificate practice statement, then describing the practices, how the X509 PKI now specifically implements the policies defined in the certificate policy document. A last key pillar to these X509 PKIs and a pillar still part of the overall aim to create trust in the X509 PKIs or audits, which are really the primary mean to attest to the outside world that an X509 PKI really implements the policies and processes declared in its certificate policy and its certification practice statement. What is interesting with X509 PKIs is that even if cryptography has a reputation of being a highly complex subject, 
everyone ever involved in the construction or operations of an actual X509 PKI will likely agree that the effort required to create trust into the X509 PKI with the various policies and processes required to define and implement often very clearly surpasses the effort required to make the cryptography and the tech side of things work. Great. Now we know that constructing and running a trustworthy X509 PKI is a lot of effort. Do we really have to bother with all of this? Do we really need all this trust into an X509 PKI? I say yes, we have to bother with all of this and I invite you to now pause the video and to try to find for yourself a convincing argument as to why we really need to have all this trust into X509 PKIs. My argument I will reveal on the next slide. Why should we bother to make all this effort of creating trust into an X509 PKI? A valid question and the supporting argument I have is best explained by a demonstration of what may happen if the X509 PKI under consideration lacks the necessary trust. Lacking trust in an X509 PKI means lacking trust in the certificates issued by the PKI, which itself means that the binding of the public keys to the end entities as given by the certificates may be inaccurate or in short, that the public keys obtained via a certificate may not be authentic copies of the public keys owned by the indicated end entities. Let's now assume that the use case of the PKI is to enable Alice to send a plain text confidentially to Bob such that only Bob can access the plain text. For this, Alice has to request the public key of Bob. This request reaches Bob, who we can assume to be honest as well, and with Bob then sending out his public key as a response to the request of Alice. Now, unbeknown to both Alice and Bob, this response of Bob with his public key is intercepted by Eve, who simply replaces the public key of Bob with her own public key, so the public key that then ultimately reaches Alice is really the public key of Eve and not the public key of Bob. As by our assumption, this public key now lacks authenticity. Alice may see that she immediately got a response on her request for the public key of Bob. This response may even look like it came from Bob, but due to the lack of authenticity on the key, Alice can't detect that the public key contained in the response is actually the key of Eve and not the key of Bob. Believing that the public key contained in the response is the public key of Bob, Alice then proceeds to encrypt her plain text with the received public key, which results in a ciphertext, which Alice then sends out to Bob. However, given that the ciphertext was now really encrypted with the public key of Eve, Eve can again just intercept the ciphertext sent by Alice and decrypt the ciphertext into the original plaintext by Eve making use of her corresponding private key. This results in the original plaintext now readily available to Eve and Eve, in order to have her interceptions go unnoticed, can now re-encrypt the plaintext with the public key of Bob that she intercepted beforehand, which again results in a ciphertext that Eve then finally sends to Bob. Bob then receives a ciphertext encrypted with his public key, so Bob can then recover the original plaintext by using his private key. If the keys lack authenticity, then the interception of Eve really may go unnoticed, but with very clearly the plain text originally sent by Alice to only be accessible to Bob having also reached Eve, and thus if the keys lack authenticity, confidentiality may not be able to be constructed within this digital information system. This is a classic example of a man in the middle attack 
possible if keys lack authenticity and is a main argument as to why it really is necessary to ensure that keys used for cryptographic purposes are authentic and why as such it is necessary to being able to completely trust x509 pkis which essentially is trusting the x509 pki to accurately bind public keys to end entities with which the PKI ultimately establishes the authenticity of the public keys obtained and used.